<laughs> okay, there was, uh, before I move on, I want to uh, mention one further thing, which I should have mentioned the first time. Uh, which is that uh, there's another important conservation law for the energy critical wave equation, and that's the momentum. So. So this is another conservation law that the nonlinear wave equation in the energy critical case has. Uh, notice that it makes sense because the gradient is in L2 and the t de derivative is in L2. Okay, and this is a constant in time, and somehow uh, this is fundamental in the non-radial case. In radial situations, this doesn't play a role because it's zero. Right, if you take uh, two radial functions, u0 and u1, this integral is zero. Okay, you don't need to know any equation. Okay. All right. You can, uh, maybe I leave a small exercise to, to <laughs> check that. <laughs> okay. So I, I just wanted to mention this because I, I, it's an important fact uh, in non-radial situations even though the first thing I'm going to do today is completely radial. But <laughs> anyway, it comes with the uh, preliminaries. So basically what we regard is the first lecture was preliminaries, and today we actually start. Okay. So uh, maybe I erase to be with a clean slate. If you think about the statement that I made as to what solid and resolution means, and uh, remember that uh, we know what the traveling waves are already for the nonlinear wave equation, they're precisely the Lorentz transformations of solutions of the elliptic equation. And solid and resolution means that as you approach the final time of existence, your solution can be decomposed uh, into a finite sum of modulated uh, uh, traveling waves plus a linear solution plus a term that goes to zero. Okay. Now, if you think about this statement for a minute, you see that it, if it held, it would mean that the a energy norm of the solution would have to remain bounded up to the final time. And so, because of that, we will consider here only bounded solutions of the energy critical wave equation. That is to say, so what are bounded solutions? <coughs> Suppose that T plus is finite, then uh, And we call this type 2 blow up solutions. Okay, so the two statements are the same, but I just uh, dividing it into the two cases, okay? So we will now stick to this kind of solutions. And uh, one thing that uh, 
is important in the case when t plus is finite is something that we call the singular set. <coughs> so the singular set is defined as, following, as follows. We will first define the regular set and the singular set will be its complement. Okay? So we say that a point x0 is regular if uh, there's no uniform concentration at x0. So that means that uh, for all epsilon positive, there exists an R positive such that for all t up to t plus, so t plus is finite, okay? Uh, the integral from x minus x0 less than r of the gradient xt u of xt squared, the x is less than epsilon. Okay, so there's uniform absolute continuity of the gradient squared for all times, okay? And we say that uh, x0 belongs to S, or S is just a complement of the critical, uh, of the regular points. And uh, it's an important fact Oops. that S is n never empty and finite. Okay, so if T plus is finite and you remain bounded, there must be at least one singular point. If there were no singular points, you could go forward more. And because the norm, the, the energy norm is uniformly bounded, then that guarantees there's only finitely many singular points, okay? So in particular, suppose that U is radial. So suppose that we have a radial solution. Then its values are the same on a whole sphere, which is an infinite set. So what can be the only singular point? The origin. Okay. Just by counting. Okay. <coughs> right. So uh, we will now turn to. Uh, solid and resolution in the radial case. Okay. <coughs> and I, I uh, re-emphasize that we're working on R3. And here, in what I'm going to say, this 3 has a special role, okay? So solid on resolution in the radial case in R3 um, was first proved by Dutair, myself, and Merle in 2012 along 
a well-chosen sequence of times and then for any sequence of times. So first let me explain what this statement means. So for a well-chosen sequence of times means that we can find one sequence of times that we choose very carefully along which we can prove that for u in the sequence of times we can decompose it as a sum of uh, modulated solitons plus radiation term plus error that goes to zero. Okay, But we have to select the sequence of times. And the second statement says that no matter what sequence of times we take going to the final time, this holds. So clearly the second result is stronger than the first. Okay. The, the second thing I want to mention is what are the solitons in the radial case? So that means that we have to go back to radial solutions of the nonlinear elliptic equation. What are the nonlinear the radial solutions of the nonlinear elliptic equation? And we saw last time that by work of Gidas Nee Nirnberg and Pohoshaev, that's exactly W and minus W and their scalings. So there's only one uh, solid. Okay. No other solution of the elliptic equation is radial. And by taking Lorentz transformations, you cannot make something radial that wasn't radial. Okay. So this isn't. Okay. So what is it that happens that produces soliton resolution? So there's a heuristics that says, let's say we look at the a finite time blow, blow up case. That what's happening is that because we're working in an infinite uh, space domain, energy is being shifted away from a truncated cone with vertex at the singular point towards infinity. And as you shift a little bit of energy, you get to an exact amount of energy like a sum of solitons and you do this through the radiation, then you take out some more energy moving to infinity and you pick up a soliton that does that and you continue like that. So that's the, the intuition, that what you need to understand is how energy gets pushed out to spatial infinity as you approach the blow up time or the infinite time. Okay, so what we... Uh, managed to do is find a, a, a way to measure this in, in math instead of in pictures with my hands, okay? Or physical experiments. Um, so uh, the fundamental new tool, which I'm going to explain now, is a dynamical characterization of W that has to do with this uh, ejection of energy. So fundamental new fact. Of course, it's not new today. It was new when we proved this. So. Let U be a radial bounded solution of NLW in exists for all positive and negative time. Okay? Suppose U is not zero which is not, not interesting. Uh, 
and it's not W or one of its scalings or negative W. Okay? Then we have the following estimate. I'm going to call this star. So there's always energy. Oh, so uh, yeah. For all t bigger than or equal to 0, or all t less than or equal to 0. So in one time direction, there's always a definite amount of energy outside, unless you're w. Uh, so the first thing you, you need to convince yourself, remember what w is. The first thing you, you have to do in your heads is that this doesn't happen for W. So the gradient of W would be 1 over x squared at infinity. And then uh, you're in 3D. You get 1 over r to the fourth. You integrate r cubed. and so Anyway, uh, r squared, I'm sorry. So you're integrating 1 over r squared. You get a 1 over r. That goes to 0 at infinity. You can never get something like that because you have the t here. Okay. So definitely for w, this isn't true. What we're saying here is that unless we meet w, this is true. And this is a way to capture w. And this is, of course, what's capturing the fact that there's energy going out. This is a lower bound on the outside part for t positive or t negative, OK? So let me just say a few words on the proof of this thing, OK? Let me just say a few words about the proof. So uh, our proof relied on a basic fact about radial solutions of the linear wave equation in 3D. Okay, so this is a basic fact that could have been proved by D'Alembert. Okay, so it's a completely elementary fact. Okay, so I'll write what, what the estimate is. So V, a radial solution of the linear wave, maybe D, I don't know, uh, D equals 3. OK, let me just uh, put that here. Then. For all T positive or for all t negative. So the difference between positive and negative time comes from the fact of whether you're considering incoming waves or outgoing waves. And that's all that this is. You're splitting your, your solutions into incoming or outgoing. If you are one, you get one time direction. If not, you can get the other. OK?
So you have this inequality that for t all t positive or for all t negative, we have a uniform lower bound on this outer part of the energy in terms of the initial one. Okay. So let me first uh, make one uh, remark. Here, I don't exactly have the, the initial the initial energy because I have the R inside instead of outside. Why do I do that? Because if I put the R outside, this is false. Okay, so I just uh, make V1, V0, and V0 equal 1 over R for R bigger than R0 and 1 over R0 for r less than r0, OK? This is a perfectly acceptable choice. Uh, what is v? Let me draw a picture of the v. Here is r0. I, I'll make the cone like that. <coughs> In here, v is 1 over r. Why is that? Because 1 over r is the fundamental solution for the Laplacian, it's the Newtonian potential. So away from the origin, it's harmonic. Okay? Since it's harmonic, it will solve the wave equation. And by finite speed of propagation, it will have to be exactly this in this region. Okay? And I don't care what it is inside, because my estimate looks at things outside. Okay? And now what happens with 1 over r, this thing gets to go to 0 when t goes to infinity. If I had the r outside, this would be 0. This would not be 0, I'm sorry. But if I have the r inside, it is 0. So full thing is 0, no, 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 no. No. Not if the r is outside, no, no. No, this is the exact point, that if the r is outside, that thing is not 0. If the r is inside, it is 0. Because r times 1 over r is 1, and therefore the derivative of 1 is 0. That's why this is the correct uh, formulation. OK? All right. So let me explain how one uses this in uh, to do the proof of soliton resolution. Okay? I will do it in the finite time blow up because it's slightly easier to draw the pictures. So the proof here is just to cut, I mean, like it's it's simple. The proof of this is, uh, the, uh, yes, it's one line basically. It's just one line. You, you say, let me do f of rt, which is rv of rt. This uh, solves the 1d -linear, linear wave equation. And uh, you split the 1d linear wave equation as a composition of two transport equations. And there you, you have it. OK, that's why, uh, as I was saying, this is completely uh, elementary. I mean, you can, uh, I can give this as an exercise. No, no, it's true. I, mean, I can give it as an exercise. From what I've said, if you have the patience, you, you don't need to know anything else. Okay? That's why, uh, you know, it's completely elementary. Okay. Uh, right? Okay, so let me show you how you use this to prove the soliton resolution in the radial case and define it blow up. Let me assume that t plus is 1. And I have u. And I, need, I want to do the soliton resolution for u. OK? Let me take a sequence tn tending to 1. Then the first observation is that this has a weak limit. Okay, 
I'm used to calling it D0, so I stick to that. It has a weak limit. Of course, that, uh, along any sequence, it has a weak limit, just by boundedness. On the other hand, one can prove that the weak limit is unique. It doesn't depend on the sequence. Okay. okay. The next thing that you do is you call V be the solution of NLW with data v0, v1 at t plus equal 1. Okay? So that certainly exists. And it, it's a very nice solution up to t plus equal to 1 for t near 1. I mean, this is small data theory, if you, if you wish. Okay? Now, what happens with is that the support of u of t minus v of t is contained in the ball around 0 of radius 1 minus t. This is where u minus v lives. And you can see that if this wasn't the case, Using finite speed of propagation, you could prove that zero is not in the singular set. Okay? So this gets completely localized. So everything that is happening here is inside this inverted light cone. Outside that inverted light cone, my solution equals a regular solution, so I don't have to do anything to it. And this will be the radiation term, the, this V. And because this is a, a regular solution, V of t is like VL of t for t near 1. That's from the small data theory. <laughs> the time is very close to 1. The nonlinear solution and the linear solution are very close together. So that's why this is the radiation term. OK. So what am I going to do next? What I do next is uh, split u of tn minus v of tn into blocks. Okay, so these are nonlinear blocks. What are these? In the technical language, they are the nonlinear profiles in the linear profile decomposition of this difference along this sequence of times. OK? Well, you just think of them as blocks, blocks of energy. OK? Now we're going to understand each one of these blocks of energy. Let's take one of these blocks of energy and assume it is not W lambda. OK? What we really want to show is that they're all W or minus W, right? Scaled. Because that's what the soliton resolution says. So suppose one of them is not, OK? Then it will have this kind of uh, dynamic character. It will have this kind of outer energy property. There's some energy outside. And so if that property holds for of all positive time, there'll be a chunk of energy here, right, from this inequality. But there can't be any energy there because the support is in here. So that's a contradiction. So that had to be W. Now, if the thing happens for negative time, let me use, uh, let me use uh, another color. I'm going to use that going backwards like that. And then there'll have to be energy here, a fixed amount, though. It would have to be a fixed amount of energy there. And as I approach the here, this gets smaller and smaller, and this is a fixed function. So it can't have 
a fixed amount of energy in a set of measure going to zero. Mm -hmm. So that's also a contradiction. So either way, you reach a contradiction, and so that block had to be W. Now we've killed all the, all the profiles. All the profiles are now W. Now the error, remember, only went to zero in the dispersive sense. We now want it to go to zero in the energy sense. Okay? But then you run the same argument on the, on the error. Because everything here, uh, but now you use this property. And the constants are uniform, even though I have a sequence. And either it happens going forward or backward, but in each case I reach a contradiction. So the energy has to go to zero. OK? And so that's <coughs> the proof. OK, uh, there's some cheating involved. Obviously, I haven't given a complete proof, but this is the idea. All right. Now, it <laughs> yes, yes. This is the proof of every sequence of times. You never select. No, right. This is th this is this uh, theorem. I I will now explain the other one. Okay. I will. It's weaker, but it's uh, it's weaker but more flexible in some way. Okay. So that's why I want to. Do you have another question? So yes. Yeah. So the proof that you give in the free case is just a, an heuristic argument to show that to convince us, or you need this. You need this to do that. The 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 point is uh, that you can use the linear one in the nonlinear case because of this freedom in the R. Suppose that your solution uh, didn't have compact support, so that there's always energy far out. Then I pick my r very, very far out, so that the part outside at time 0 has small norm. And then by the finite speed, I can reduce to that case. And if, I, if it has small norm, I can use uh, the fact that the linear solution and the nonlinear solution are close to each other. Now if it has compact support, what I do, I go to the very edge of the support. And that's how I pick my R. OK, so th this is flexible enough that by always going outside of cones, I can manage from to pass from the linear to the nonlinear case without assuming smallness. So th this is the, the, the point of this idea. OK? We have another question. So you said the V doesn't depend on the sequence. Yes. And the result depends on the sequences, or the solitons depend on the sequences? No, no, the solitons are just W in the radial case. There's nothing else. But that can be a few ones. Yes. The number gets fixed by the energy. By energy, OK? But uh, the, the fact that the V does not depend on the sequence is just some extra information. <coughs> OK? Other questions? P please ask, because this is a good time to ask. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, uh, this is really the idea of the proof. I mean, I haven't cheated. OK. So let me explain uh, this other proof. OK? Oh, but before I do that, OK, uh, I have to explain a few other things. First, you saw that I was very careful here to say that this is d equal to 3. OK? So the first thing is that for any even dimension, this fails. This corresponding statement is false. It's not that we don't know how to prove it. We know how to find a counterexample. OK? This is false for radial solutions in every even dimension. Okay. First thing. Even with r0 equals 0, even in that case. OK? First thing. Second thing I'd like to say is that in the non-radial case, even with d equals 3, 
and R0 is positive, such an inequality is also false. So you can see by going to higher order spherical harmonics. OK? So there's not that much wiggle room here. For the radial case in uh, higher odd dimensions, there is a variant of this inequality. That's true. That uh, w was proved by uh, Laurie, Liu, uh, Schlag, and myself. You can ask Bao Ping, who's here. Bao Ping Liu, who's sitting here, about the proof of that. Still, the constant is one half. The expression in here becomes much more complicated as the dimension increases. So you can interpret this as being the difference between the initial data and the orthogonal uh, complement in the Hilbert space of the one-dimensional line produced by this. Okay. And then in higher dimensions, you take uh, orthogonal projections to the complement of finite dimensional spaces with increasing size depending on the dimension. OK? And there's some interesting combinatorics and some linear algebra in those proofs. OK? OK. So now let me go to, to this proof. I <laughs> I need some help for that. So for for this proof, the the idea was uh, different, and I'll explain how we choose the sequence of time somehow. Okay. So the first point was to prove that there's no cell similar blow up. In this problem, it's always fundamental to understand self-similar behavior. So for instance, in, in the finite time blow up case, that means that the integral for uh, x bigger than lambda times 1 minus t and t of grad xt u of xt squared dx is always tends to 0 with t as t tends to 1 for all <laughs> lambda less than 1. So in here, there's no energy. So all the energy concentrates close to the axis. I mean, there's a spike. Pardon me? 1 minus t, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. OK. So that was the first step. Now, how did we prove this? OK, our original proof of this fact used double star. Now, since then, there's been a different proof that uh, uses ideas developed in the theory of wave maps. But I will not uh, go to that. Okay. So the second step is that this <coughs> implies Lack of cell similar blow up implies 
that in the Cesaro means the DDT derivative goes to zero inside the cone. Okay? So how does one prove uh, from this that one uses virial identities? And I need to mention virial identities. This seems to be a good time to do it. They play a role everywhere in this theory. In the radial case, we don't use the last virial identity. We just use the two, these two. This one is the one that you use in non-radial situations, and you see that it connects with the momentum, which is what I started with. Okay. So how do you use these two virial identities? Uh, we multiply this one by one half and we add them. And that isolates minus ddt squared plus the error. And we do the integration in time, and the time integral uh, makes the things go to zero, provided that we, show we choose this cutoff function to be like that, supported in that situation. And the errors go to zero because there's no self-similar blow up. Okay? And that's how you prove this. So what does this mean? Somehow, on average, my solution is time independent. Because the DDT derivative is going to zero. Since it is time independent, it has to be uh, resembling W, which is the only time independent solution. And that's how you prove that each profile has to be W in this case. Where do you pass from a sequence to a subsequence? Let me call this something. This is the classical Tauberian argument that if, if you have the Cesaro means going to zero, for a subsequence you're converging to zero. Okay. Basically, this is the idea. Okay, and that's how you need a subsequence. Uh, this is uh, the classical Tauberian kind of argument. So, this kind of thing used to be taught in first year analysis. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not even when I was a student was that taught <laughs> in first year analysis. Okay.
So this gives you an idea of how this works. OK. And let me just say that this idea allowed one to generalize the, along a well-chosen sequence of times. to all dimensions eventually, okay, in the radial case. But now we will see how that works even in the non-radial case. So that's the next part of the, of the course, okay? So, so uh, uh, again, so here the exact statement would be what, like in these two theorems. So what are the assumptions? In this, uh, let me just uh, go Precisely, but I, I will go. Uh, I will give a precise statement of a more general result. Okay, but uh, I'll say it in words quickly. Uh, here it says that the uh, let's say the let's do the case of infinite time. There's a s for any sequence t n going to infinity, I can find scalings lambdas of n and sines uh, uh, i j and such that the sum of i, j, w scaled by lambda j plus a linear solution minus my nonlinear solution tends to zero along this sequence of times. Okay, and this can be done for any sequence of times. And this statement is the fact that I can choose a sequence of times going to infinity such that that happens. Okay? But uh, there will be a time when the theorem will be stated very precisely, and it's coming very soon, <laughs> okay? Before the end of the day today, okay? Uh, and yes? So uh, when, when, when we dynamic categorization of W, you explain that there are proof. Uh, I understand that there is a case by counter example, but which step do you use is not W? So which, is, which step do you use the condition the solution is not W? to show that there's these channels of energy going out that give me, kill each profile. No, I mean, how we use the linear, linear property to derive the nonlinear property. I think you have to say that you cheated. Yes, I cheated a little <laughs> bit, yes. Just to yeah. Prove that the yeah, no, there's a part that has to do with W is a solution up to the inside that I can't always cut that I haven't shown, okay? But it is in the notes that are on the web, okay? <laughs> Not only in the paper, but the, in, the, in those notes, okay? And the arguments are reminiscent of uh, elliptic theory, okay? So those arguments resemble uh, elliptic theory. Yeah. Is there a way to state the, the result of DKM13 without referring to sequence? But Oh yes, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. No, but I'm doing it with the sequence because I'm comparing it to the yeah, other to the other result. No, but th that's how it's stated. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this this theorem is not really a theorem about sequences, but about continuous parameters. But anyway, but it's equivalent. Uh, no, because I'm doing it only in the sequence case. <laughs> anyway, I, I'll just say it. It's in the notes. It's it, it <laughs> is in some notes. <laughs> yes, it's in the notes on the web. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So I, I'm going to now go to the non-radial case. Okay. So a non-radial case. This is work of Gia 15, DKM 16, and DK, DJKM 16. So there's three papers comprising this work. 
Okay? And I'll explain uh, how, we, uh, how it goes. So, but the first thing I want to say is what are the difficulties in the non-radial case? Let's, let's try to see. First, as I explained earlier, uh, this kind of inequality to star for all solutions of the linear equation is just not available. Okay? It's, just not, it's not that we can't prove it, it's just not true. Okay? Second thing, in the case of radial solutions, there's only one possible uh, uh, soliton, right? It's just W. And we know its formula. Right? It's right over there. It's a very simple object. In the case of the non-radial case, we have a zoo of uh, possible traveling waves. Each solution of the nonlinear elliptic equation gives rise to a whole family of traveling waves by Lorentz transformations. And we don't know who these nonlinear solutions are. They're just some objects that live out there. So uh, a dynamical uh, characterization along these lines is uh, out of the question. So we have to abandon such a plan. And so we're going to do a plan which is more reminiscent of this one, of the one where we use this. Okay? So that's the, the approach. And if we're going to do that, then we're going to get a result for a, a well-chosen sequence of times, not for all sequences of times. And I'll say more about that uh, tomorrow. Okay? So the first thing I want to, so, uh, to say is uh, I want to make a few more comments about the uh, radiation term. before I begin. In the case when t plus is less than infinity, we showed in this paper, as I mentioned in the, in the other board, that Let me just do it this way. That U of T converges weakly to a V0, V1, which is in H1 cross L2. So there is a weak limit. And if we call V of T, again, the solution of the nonlinear wave, Then uh, let me write down uh, okay. Uh, so those are the singular points. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And those are the singular points. Then the support of a u of t minus v of t is contained in the union of these cones. Okay. And that's a similar argument using finite speed of propagation. And the fact that uh, otherwise um, this would be uh, not regular point, not singular points, but regular points. So the, the picture is that we have a whole bunch of cones here. But there's all only finitely many. Okay? So if we go close enough to t, t equal to 1, they're all completely separated, and we can just concentrate on each one singular point at a time. 
Okay? And that's what we will do. Okay. Now, in the case of infinite time, the extraction of, the, of this uh, radiation term, and which is what we call the scattering profile, is much more difficult. Uh, So for t plus equals infinity, this is in this paper that I mentioned. We showed how to extract the radiation. So this is the part of the nonlinear solution that has linear behavior. Okay? When it is scattered, when the solution scatters, it's the whole thing. But when it doesn't scatter, there's obstructions to it being the whole thing. And so what we did is the following. We look at the linear solution on uh, this data. and show that this has a weak limit as t goes to infinity. Then we constructed the VL of t is simply the linear solution with data this weak limit. And we proved that for all a in R, So that at any finite distance from the light cone, the nonlinear solution behaves like this linear solution, VL. Okay. So again, all of the action is inside, strictly inside the light cone. Otherwise, it's linear behavior. Okay. The key idea of the proof is to use virial identities, the three identities that I either erased or hid, I hid, use virial identities to show that there are no blocks close to the light cone. And this is coherent with the fact that the nonlinear objects, which are the traveling waves, travel at speeds strictly less than one. And so if we stick close to speed one, we have to avoid all those traveling waves, so the only thing that can be is linear behavior. And we prove this using this, uh, well, the, the proof is, I would say, not, not simple, but the key tool are these three identities. And this one is used because we are in non-radial setting. Okay? And I will say no more about this. 
So now I'm going to show. A p uh, uh, I need the transparencies now. So I'll show the theorem now. So I'm f I'm afraid that, oops, the theorem is lengthy. So we start with a bounded solution of the nonlinear wave equation. We look at the uh, first definite blow-up case, and we fix one singular point. Then we can find a, a number of traveling waves, J star, a little radius R star that keeps us away from the, all the other <coughs> possible singular points. V0, V1, which is the, the <coughs> radiation term, a sequence of times which tends to T plus, scales which go faster than the self similar rate to zero, positions which are the center of the traveling waves, and which are strictly inside by a factor beta of the inverted light cone at X star. And with this Lj, which gives me the direction of the traveling wave given by this limit between the position and the time. This is well defined. And traveling waves, that means Lorentz transformations in the direction Lj of solutions Qj to the nonlinear elliptic equation, such that inside this little ball that stays away from all the other singular points, U is the radiation term, the sum of the translated and rescaled solitary waves, plus an error that goes to zero. And moreover, the, uh, the, uh, this sum is decoupled in the sense that the parameters are orthogonal in this sense. Okay. So this is the precise statement, T plus finite. Now let me go to the t plus plus infinity case. There's a VL solving the linear wave equation with this property that I explained that away from the light cone, the difference goes to zero. Then I have J traveling waves. There might be no traveling wave in case my solution scatters. Right? If my solution scatters, I have no traveling wave. Then I have scales, again faster than the self-similar rate, positions strictly inside the light cone, <coughs> directions of traveling waves, Lj, strictly less than one, traveling waves such that the solution is the linear solution <coughs> plus the sum of the rescaled traveling waves plus an error that goes to zero, and again the traveling waves are decoupled. So this is a precise description of the asymptotics along this sequence of times. Okay? And what we're going to do the rest of the time is uh, sketch a proof of this. Okay? So I, I want to make some comments. The T plus being a finite, that case, was proven by GI in 15, but the error term went to zero in the weaker dispersive norm in his case. Then uh, in this joint paper, using the fact that we could extract the scattering profile, we, we were able to do this both for finite and infinite time and show that the errors tend to zero in the energy space. Okay. So the plan is now to show this proof. Okay, and I have one lecture and ten minutes to do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I wonder, Karloff, if you can show the result in the radial case because I think it's too unclear. Okay. Uh, no, no, uh, you have it. In Not in this one. I don't think. No, but I have it in another one. Okay. 
Yeah. You're telling me people are tired, Frank. No, no. <laughs> the thing is, other case is to and to. Okay. Uh, to, to write it for a sequence makes it complicated. Oh, but I did write it always for a sequence. I'm sorry. No, I don't have that in. Uh, but I will write it. But maybe we turn off the. So uh, I'll, I'll give you the statement in the radial case. So in the radial case, let's say, let me give it in the in the case t plus is infinite. I mean, don't I don't want to do it in both cases. This is one. So now u is a solution of NLW, then there exists a J star uh, J star could be zero uh, functions lambda J of T that have the property Ij, which are signs plus or minus one, such that u of t equals dl of t plus sum j equals zero to j star of Ij. W scaled by lambda j of t of x plus little o of 1 in h1 cross l2. And notice one thing that I didn't do in this statement is I didn't assume that u was bounded. Because in fact our proof shows that if it exists for all time it has to be bounded in the radial case. Okay? So this is the precise statement in the radial case. So th and then you can relate G star to the bound? N to the energy, yeah. So which one gives what? I mean, which well, somehow the, the, the number J star and the, and the energy are related. And they are related also to the energy of W. And I don't remember the exact uh, relationship, but somehow the J stars is how many pieces of energy of W you have to put to get to the energy. Wha what is true is that the energy of U has also to be str uh, positive, strictly positive. Otherwise, it cannot exist globally. Okay? So it's not an, assum uh, an assumption, it's a consequence of existing globally. All right? Did you have a question? No? no. Okay. Any other question? For the non radial case, if I remember well, only for a specific uh, sequence. Yes. So far. Not so far. <laughs> Hope springs eternal. <laughs> okay. Okay, so maybe I don't punish you anymore. And w and we we have five minutes of uh, extra time of, of rest or questions. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. Question, some more questions or comments or uh, anything that needs clarifying. I'd be happy to clarify some more. Yes, I was wondering. Can you say again what is the argument to say that the number of singularity is finite? Uh, Yes, it has to do with the fact that, uh, let me see, this epsilon, you actually don't need it to be 
all epsilon, but a fixed amount that depends on the local well posedness theory <coughs> suffices. And because of that, if there's infinitely many, <coughs> not me? no. if there's infinitely many, you accumulate too much norm, and the norm is bounded. Okay? Uh, other questions? Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. It's interesting to notice that even in the non radial case, your scattering profile is completely determined, does not depend on any sequence. No, no, no. That's correct. So, so, so that's why one good feature. Yeah, absolutely. It's one step forward, yes. So the proof is, is about, because even this weak convergence for the whole time yes. does not seem very... No, it's, not, it's, it's non-trivial, yeah. It's actually a consequence of the whole proof. Okay. So what we do is we first start with the sequence and prove the weak limit and then show that this weak limit has to be the only. Okay? Yeah. Uh, the J star, does that have to be finite? Yes. The number Again, for, for, the, uh, for the energy... Bound. For the same reason. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, maybe I make a comment before the question. Uh, and that's also the reason why the traveling waves, these parameters Lj, have to be strictly less than 1. Because as uh, L goes to 1, the energy norm of the Lorentz transformation of an elliptic thing blows up. Okay? So in your statement, you had uh, the, the ratios between the frequencies, um, such as frequencies, yes. tend to zero. Is there a heuristic explanation for why this might be the case? What, the, uh, what happens is that they are truly separated. They live in different scales. For each scale, there is one. Okay. That's we the... Should that's it. Apply, uh, it will be a different function. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can... Uh, this is... Yes. So this is more philosophical question in general. So this um, soliton resolution conjecture should, I guess, not only be true for nonlinear wave, but also for nonlinear shading and other equations. It seems to me that somehow finite speed of propagation really played a huge role. Oh, yes, this is completely correct. Um, can you somehow comment on how you view what should go on for <laughs> sure? <laughs> Give me that and a million dollars, right? <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, it is too early to speculate about that. I mean, this, uh, I think, are very solid and general arguments in the presence of finite speed of propagation. How to go to infinite speed is a, another big jump. What's the key argument uh, behind the fact that if you're global, then uh, you're bound to? Oh, the key uh, is that Just you can, is, yeah, is, well, no, uh, not exactly. I mean, what it is, is you go run through the whole proof, basically. You f first, you prove that there is a sequence on which you are bounded, because otherwise you must blow up in finite time by an argument of Levine, uh, an old argument. Then you use this sequence at which you are bounded to do the decomposition into uh, solitons. From that, once you have that, you can prove the boundaries. Uh, okay, so we prove the solitons for, for the chain which is bounded, and then by brute force, we force it over time. Yeah. So we still have to start for one chain. Uh, for a well prepared. Yeah, so the first sequence that you, you start is the one on which it is bounded and which you know exists, because otherwise it would blow up. So other questions uh, or remarks? In the yes. dynamical characterization of the ground state, you said that uh, you could uh, use the linear uh, equation by saying that if the support is infinite, then you choose an R sufficiently large, yeah. and outside it behaves like the linear equation. Yeah. But I don't see in the argument where you use that you're not W. Well, uh, no. That's the cheating, that's the cheating yeah. Oh, okay. that's <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is a... Uh, no, there, there, there are arguments that are, uh, I would say, of iterative elliptic type. Okay. Somehow, uh, 
there is a, an ODE that WS uh, verifies, and it depends on the precise uh, values of solutions of the ODE all the way up to zero. Okay. This dynamic uh, characterization of W resembles the your your UV uh, kind yes. of pro. Yes. So it's it's key. Yes. 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 The fact that we are close. Well, to the ground state. It's very close, but, but, but the, bond, the norm was close to the L2 norm was close to the norm of the, of the ground state. Here, there is no assumption of size. So if you take a solution which you eventually resolve into the suppose M bubbles, and if you perturb the initial data a little bit, would it be possible to have all the other cases coming up? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Take W, okay? In any neighborhood of W, you can find type 1 blow-up solutions, type 2 blow-up solutions, solutions that exist globally and scatter to a linear solution, solutions that exist globally and scatter to W. Okay? In any neighborhood of W. So, so the thing is extremely unstable. Uh, for example, if you do n bubble, you're, su uh, you're suspecting that uh, like a minus one bubble and all the other possibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, that's energetic considerations. Yeah. You can reduce, but you find that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, other question from Anna? Okay, if you still, okay. Because you go to start, uh, to, st to stop early because then we have five minutes, uh, we have five minutes left. So we take 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.